Hello, and welcome to the Design News webinar, Beyond Bars, Tees, and Angles, Designing Aluminum Extrusion to Meet Product Challenges, brought to you by Aluminum Extruders Council. My name is Ann Thrift. I'm Senior Technical Editor, Materials and Assembly of Design News, and I'll be your moderator today. This webinar is designed to be interactive, to learn about today's speakers, view additional resources from our sponsors, share and talk about this webinar via various social media outlets, and submit questions by clicking on the widgets in the dock at the bottom of the console. Please ask questions at any time during the presentation by typing your question in the Ask a Question widget and clicking Submit. Submit questions as they come to mind, and our speaker will address them during the Q&A session as time permits. At the end of the webinar, we will ask you to complete a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out, as your feedback is important to us and will provide valuable information on the subjects covered in this webinar, as well as how we can improve future broadcasts. And now I'm pleased to welcome Craig Warner, Chairman of Aluminum Extruders Council's AEC Academy Program, and President of Warner Extrusion Solutions, and Joe Jackman, Vice President, Sales and Marketing of Almeg Aluminum. Craig is the Chairman of the Aluminum Extruders Council's Academy Program, and president of Warner Extrusion Solutions. That company is an extrusion design and process consulting firm. At WES, his focus is twofold. He assists extruder clients in process optimization and developing highly effective extrusion-based structures, particularly for the alternative energy industry. Joe has been designing extrusions with customers of Almag Aluminum for over 14 years, with a key focus on thin-walled, tight tolerance, high visual, and high tongue ratio profiles. But first, before we get started, we'd like to ask the audience a question. And that is, what is your experience with extrusions? And the four answers are either minimal, I really haven't explored it, I've considered extrusion-based components, but I haven't really used them, I have used extrusion-based components in the past, or I have extensive experience using extrusion. And we'll give you a few seconds to answer. So it looks like most of you have used extrusion-based components in the past. That's about a little over half. Um, about 22 or 3 percent of you have considered using them, but haven't yet. About 15 percent haven't really explored, and 6.5 percent have extensive experience using extrusion. And now, Joe, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Ian. When working with aluminum extrusions, the shape is the idea. Almost any shape can be designed and produced using aluminum extrusion. The right shape utilizing the proper alloy can then be enhanced, tweaked, and perfected through additional fabrication and finishing to give you an effective solution for your product. Today's webinar will give you both a conceptual and a practical understanding of how to creatively address some of your product challenges by using aluminum extrusion. Craig will start by walking us through some of the many advantages of aluminum and of extrusion, as well as how the aluminum extrusion process works. He'll then touch on some of the key design variables, including some of the different extrusion alloys and some potential key shapes that can be incorporated into your extrusion design. I will then discuss a few of the many fabrication options that are available with extrusion, and I'll go through some of the case studies that will show you the value of having an aluminum extruder work with you as early as possible in your project to help you incorporate as many features uh, that will help give you a solution with a lower total cost. Then we'll point you in the direction of some additional resources, and we'll wrap it up with the Q&A session. So I'll pass it over to Craig to tell us about some of the advantages of aluminum and extrusion. Thank you very much, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, aluminum has some ideal advantages that make it great for designers. Um, it's all of the whole list you see there on the left is true, and we're going to give you some examples of that with some future slides. But it's really combining the advantages of aluminum with the advantages of the extrusion process 
that really brings the matter to bear to, to make terrific designs. So let's, uh, let's take a few minutes and talk about that. First, aluminum uh, is very strong. It can, be, uh, it can be very similar to steel in strength, and it can be, uh, depending on the alloy and temper chosen, it can be ex extraordinarily strong. People's lives depend on the use of aluminum extrusions. And uh, it has a, a very high strength to weight ratio. Anybody who's uh, watching the automotive industry over the last few years sees more and more use of aluminum uh, components and aluminum extrusions in all types of different applications. This is just a photo of the uh, Corvette C7 showing, uh, despite being a lighter frame, it's quite a bit stiffer than the, the older steel frame that was used. And that's true in many, many different applications, automotive and beyond. Aluminum as a material is uh, very corrosion resistant. Um, it forms an oxide film, but different than uh, iron products, you don't get iron oxide, which is rust, which then spalls off. It's a very inert and very tenacious film, which doesn't come off of the extrusion. If it's scratched through, it immediately forms a, another film over top of it. Another advantage of extrusions is that uh, they're not impaired by cold. They actually get stronger and tougher as it gets colder, which is kind of the opposite of steel and plastics. And I love this photo because it shows some crazy person upside down in a snowmobile. And you know in a while he's going to flip that thing around and land. And when he lands, the back end will hit, and then it's going to slam forward on the, on the skis. And uh, what's keeping that ski from collapsing is that aluminum extrusion that's shown in the call-out bubble. So it gets very, very good cold strength. Aluminum is also very electri electrically conductive. Uh, on a volume basis... It's about 62% as conductive as copper, but on a weight basis, it's actually twice as conductive. So it's a terrific material and very economical, and you'll see some of the other advantages that make it so in a few minutes. It's also very good at conducting and dissipating heat better than most other common materials, which makes it ideal for many, many applications. Aluminum as a material is uh, one of the ultimate green materials. It's completely uh, sustainable and fully recyclable. There's a lot of energy used in making the original aluminum, uh, when it's smelted, but from there on, the metal is used over and over and over again and remelted and recycled uh, with very little loss of uh, either energy usage or with the very little loss of material. So uh, aluminum products are often made up of a large content of recycled scrap, and uh, over a billion pounds of scrap were used a couple of years ago, just as an example. So it's a very short path from the top picture to the bottom picture where you have a, a log, which you'll see later on being used again for extrusion. So let's take a moment and talk about the extrusion process. These are a couple of different photos. Probably the easiest one to picture is the lower left where it shows the feedstock, and that would be an aluminum log, which has then been cut into a billet size. It's, it's heated up in the, the log furnace, but then it's squeezed through this die, and this particular die and backer that are shown shows uh, a two-hole extrusion extruding out of that one-piece billet. The upper photo is uh, a more accurate cross-section of dies, but it's a little bit tough to see. But you can see that multi-hole uh, hollows come out uh, of this shape. And because of the immense design flexibility of putting metal where you want in an extrusion, you can make some really terrific shapes. We're going to have some great case examples of that in a few minutes. So again, the aluminum extrusion process starts with an aluminum billet, which is uh, pushed and compressed by the dummy block and the press the stem which is to the left of that first arrow and then it goes through a die and all of this other material the backer the die ring the bolster the pressure ring and ultimately the press that it's sitting within really keeps that die from uh, bending and uh, that's terrifically important because these presses are you know many millions of pounds or 2500 ton press of so five and a half million pounds or 10 million pounds of pressure being put on these these steel dies so they do need to be properly supported what comes out the other end of the press is a, a single or multiple extrusions. This happens to be a, uh, three extrusions coming out of a billet where each of them is a, a three hollow void, three void hollow. And uh, the extrusion process uh, is it's easy to figure out if you put an I-beam die shape in front of how an I-beam comes out, but the hollows are often a little bit more difficult. This simple example of a Play-Doh machine actually shows how it happens. It's not a true seamless tube, but the material comes around uh, an internal mandrel, which uh, allows the material to split into two or more parts, and then so much pressure is required, and there's also some space on the back side of, the, of an actual extrusion die where some mixing occurs. But then the extrusion comes out as a tube, which uh, 
doesn't have a seam. The seam is actually over a distance around the periphery of the, the tube. More information is available for this online if you're interested. But uh, it's really fantastic because you can do not just simple tubes but very complex materials as well. Aluminum and aluminum extrusions can be made in uh, many different alloys. There's uh, seven different main series from the 1000 to the 7000 series. The broadest applicability is really the 6000 series alloys, which use magnesium and silicon as their alloying ingredients. These alloys have uh, good strength, corrosion resistance, good machinability, weldability, good formability. They're heat treatable. There's a lot of advantages to using them. But some of the other alloys have uh, very specific advantages as well as well, whether it's for electrical conductivity or higher strength, um, or as in the 5000 series, excellent marine corrosion resistance. So I would encourage you uh, to read up on it and to work with your extruder on your applications to make sure that uh, one of your first choices in design selection is, is choosing the proper alloy. What are your needs and what alloy can best meet those needs at the best cost? Aluminum extrusions uh, are different from other uh, materials where you'll sometimes have uh, a block that you machine things out of. And while that's true for aluminum, aluminum we can actually produce the ultimate shape that, uh, that we want. So on the left there you can see produced to close tolerances. Now what's really cool about these is it doesn't have to be a thin sliver like these. As you saw in an earlier slide, these extrusions come out very long, 100, 200 feet long, and then can be cut to the size that's desired by the, by the customer. Different from um, what might be a steel shape, you can see on the right uh, where if you're trying to make this shape out of steel, you might have to take some different I-beams and boxes and L pieces and weld them together, fasten them some other way, or some way machine out very long pieces. But in extrusion, you can actually build all these features right into the extrusion. So what comes out the front end of the press is exactly the shape you need, and you can easily build in extra little features, you know, a little bit of local thickening on the ends of those top legs, some screw bosses for fastening. Um, so it's really an ideal material and process that you can put the material exactly where you need it for design. For aesthetic reasons or sometimes in very, very corrosive environments, depending on what's happening, uh, you can easily finish extrusions with either uh, paint or anodized, wet paint, powder paint. Anodizing is a, a great surface finish uh, that uh, is very useful for extrusions. I encourage you to work with your extruders to find out if you do want an aesthetic or some type of extra protective coating. Your extruders can work with you to help define the best way to do that. In, in addition, uh, extrusions and aluminum are very easy to fabricate. They can be cut. They can be machined, finished, bent, welded, fabricated, really some uh, very easy fabrication, and most Many extrusions are fabricated. Some are used in lineal lengths with minor fabrication, and some are heavily fabricated. just depends on the application. And the beauty of this is really the designer can create exactly the shape that they want. On this uh, left part of the slide where it says joinable by various methods, these are some of the many, many different design things that you can put into an extrusion. And this is just one example. This, this particular one has a hinge and a snap fit on the upper left where that portion can hinge and then snap together. And it has a multitude of different surface finishes shown around the periphery of the part, different places to either slide bolts into or nuts into or screws into, screw brasses for putting plates on the end, heat fins for uh, dissipating heat. The beauty of extrusion is it's really up to the designer to figure out what am I trying to accomplish and then use the extrusion pro process to do it, putting metal where you need it and being creative. And you know you, that's why the, the title of the thing is Beyond Bars and Tees, et cetera. It's not just simple shapes. You can do very complex shapes, as you'll see some more in a minute. Also, because of this, extrusions are often very, very suitable for easy assembly design. So this is just an example of a very, very large scaffold that went up around the Statue of Liberty. But uh, certainly you don't want to have people playing around with nuts and bolts putting all these together. You want to have them snap together as quickly as you can, and extrusions facilitate this. Extrusion tooling is uh, very cost effective. So the, the tooling can often be between $500 and $5,000, depending on the size of the tool, whether it's a hollow. Very, very large ones can be more expensive than that. But they compare very, very favorably with other uh, tooling methods other for other materials and other processes. The, um, one of the key advantages is these tools are also fairly quick to produce. Between the low cost of the tooling and how quick it is to get these custom shapes made, the designer can uh, 
do a good job designing it, but if he needs to make a minor tweak to it, it's not a crisis to make a change um, because the tools are inexpensive and can be can be acquired very quickly, so it allows some sequential design flexibility. As with any process and any material, there are limitations. Um, extrusions have some great features, but uh, they are limited by the uh, circle size that the press can produce and the weight per foot and some other shape uh, constraints, although those shape constraints are often, the, the general rules for those are often bent and broken by very creative extruders who know how to tool and process the material. Let's start with the first one. That circle size, which is shown in the lower left photo, shows a, a yellowed shaded extrusion, which has about a 12.9 inch circle size. And that extrusion can be difficult to tool on many presses because it's just so large. The billet of an extrusion can be you know, anywhere between 6 and uh, 14 or even 16 inches, but uh, typically between 6 and 12 inches, a typical uh, billet diameter. And because of that, the larger the billet gets, the larger the tooling, and uh, eventually you get a shape that's just simply too large to extrude, except on very, very specialized presses, which gives you limited uh, flexibility for tooling. Um, you'll be able to come back to this at your leisure in the future and examine some of these slides in more detail. But this is a this is a slide that's showing the combination of circle size and weight per foot that can be uh, produced either widely available. There's lots of presses and lots of extruders who can do this. Generally available, maybe with some limited availability, or perhaps not available. So uh, very, very large and very, very light and thin shapes, too thin a wall, can also be difficult. But uh, those are really from pretty modest limitations when you see what can be done with extrusions. We'll see that in a few minutes. We talked about the uh, different uh, alloys. And uh, in general, the 6000 series, which is all I'm going to focus on now, but we could add in the 7000s and 5000s and other things as well. Uh, the 6000, though, uses a combination of mag and silicon as the main alloying ingredients. And as you go from lower left to upper right, the strength increases. And these boxes show the, uh, the alloy limit, limits, you know, minimum and maximum of mag and silicon. And uh, the... As you move up that the curve, those different dotted lines show stronger and stronger alloys. And there are different alloys for different purposes. We'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, just using autos, again, as an example, although extrusions are used for far more than just automotive applications, um, some of the harder alloys, stronger alloys, might be used for um, bumpers or for intrusion beams to protect the passenger compartment, where uh, some of the medium-strength alloys might be used for engine mounts, solar racking systems, and obviously not automotive, some structural components. They can often be uh, absorb a lot of, a lot of um, shocks and a lot of uh, compressive loads. And on the lower side, uh, the, the 6060 and 6063 are a little bit uh, prettier, easier to extrude, so you can make some more detailed extrusions and you can make some uh, very uh, nice surface finish extrusions. We'll talk about those a little bit later as well. So there's a trade-off in alloys, and this is why we always recommend that you work with uh, an extruder up front. They have experience in not only all the different alloys, but uh, more importantly, where you know a designer may have seen somewhere between zero and maybe even hundreds of different designs. These most extrusion plants have seen you know, 10, 20,000 different shapes. So they can help the designer to come up with ideas because they've seen it done before in other extrusions. As you look at different alloys, the uh, extrudability is inversely relationship with the strength. So kind of the, the stronger the alloy, typically it'll extrude a little bit slower, but the tensile and yield strengths will be higher. So it's often important to uh, choose the proper alloy to get the features that you want out of it. Uh, this chart gives you an example of some commonly used alloys along the left, along with their yield strength, and uh, some of the different features of the alloy, what the surface finish would be like. And typically, the harder alloys, surface finish goes down a little bit. Corrosion resistance is often very good for most of the extrusion alloys. If bending is a main consideration, you need to take into account whether it's very good or just uh, acceptable, depending on the alloy. Same with machining, joining, and uh, extrusion processing cost, you know, extrusion speed. So uh, you know, going from the very top, at 100% extrusion speed, you can see at the bottom the 7005 will really only run at one half the speed of a typical 6060 or 6063 shape. So that does come with a little bit of a cost because that alloy will require more hours on the press and more press time. 
again, work with your extruders to uh, to work through this. There's often you know more than one right answer. It's not like there's one alloy that's right. And this is a great example from uh, started in 2009 of the Lotus Evora, which is a terrific uh, little, very very light sports car. It makes extensive use of aluminum and aluminum extrusions. And what's interesting is it uses different types of aluminum in different parts of the of the uh, body structure, and it also uses steel parts as well. So. Uh, What's cool about extrusions, when you look at a picture like this, you kind of just see the different colors and where everything was used. But when you actually look at the variety of extrusions that were designed into this, and remember, these extrusions may cost you know, $500, $1,000, $3,000 to tool, depending on the size. These are all the different geometries, different profiles that were used in the Lotus uh, Evora. And they did this to offer... Uh, they use some lower strength alloys, but they, they design specific profiles because the tooling cost is so low that they can specialize the part to exactly what they want. And you can see how we're, there's material put where you need it for either fastening or for strengthening needs. So you, you don't need to create simple bars and tees and rods and things. You can create exactly the shape that you need to meet the design needs. When you do talk to extruders about your shapes, they'll typically start with, uh, you know, general classification of is it a solid or is it a hollow or is it a semi-hollow. A semi-hollow is a, a, a solid shape that often has to be tooled similar to a hollow just because of the piece of steel that creates the, the void in the semi-hollow. Um, so that's kind of the first level of classification. And then when you work with extruders, they'll work with you on some design parameters. But there's something really important to understand in this part, each one of these, um, each one of these examples shows this, but not this. But in fact, you can do either one of them. So starting in the upper left, that thin walled bottom C with the thick walls on the left and right, that can be extruded. But if you don't need those thick walls right and left, if you just need it more of a C shape for perhaps spacing reasons or whatever, the shape on the right will extrude better. Looking next to that, the shape with all the fins on it, you know, and a designer may look at it and say, hey, I just need a separation between these two voids in this hollow extrusion, so I'm going to make that wall as thin as I possibly can. Yeah, that's, that's easy to do in extrusion, but it's even easier to extrude it with uh, more consistent walls where you can. The shape will extrude slightly faster. So sometimes working with an extruder, you may find that the weight savings from that red circle that says not this uh, is overcome by... The, the little bit faster extrudability you can get out of the next one. Smooth transitions are, are better than uh, than having very sharp corners. So if you look in the lower light of, right of the lower left of the graphic, you'll see that there are uh, very sharp corners. Those are possible to extrude, but again, they limit the extrusion speed. Whereas the smoother shapes work better. Similarly, on the, on the shape next to it. Um, in the upper right, symmetry, it's, it's good to have symmetrical shapes, but it's certainly not required. In fact, most shapes are not required. But often, if you can make a shape symmetrical, you're better. And uh, in the lower right, it really shows there's some visual surfaces that you can put onto an extrusion for virtually no cost that will often make the material look better, perform better, not see any kind of scratches or die lines that may, that may occur, any die marks that may occur from the extrusion process. So you can often dress it up uh, for no cost uh, and have a nicer looking and equally functioning part for no extra cost. So let's talk about a couple of other uh, couple other limitations in the extrusion process. Tongues, um, if you look at the right uh, top right, tongue ratio refers to the uh, the area and the really y over x. It's the area of the part divided by the uh, the base of the steel that's squared. So if you look at the far right uh, extrusion at the bottom, you'll see that there's a slot. And a designer would be, um, their first goal if they were going to make something that they needed to slide another panel into would be to make a shape that looks just like this. It looks very simple to extrude. And in fact, it is. But the piece of tool steel that's making that narrow tongue uh, has to withstand a lot of forces. It's going to want to try to bend that tongue. So if possible, it's actually easier and be more cost effective to make the shape on the left, where you have that little dog leg out that's creating a little bit wider slot. But you can see at the top and bottom of that feature, 
you're creating the exact same ultimate support for the panel. So again, working with an extruder will help you to make some minor, minor modifications that can create a better solution. Sometimes if you have deep tongue ratio requirements, you can make parts that have a, a bending portion built into it, like on the left, or sometimes you can e even make parts that have a rollout portion where uh, you can either pull out or send to a rolling mill and snap out this part. Um, Extrusions can have a, just a multitude of different design features built in. One of the common ones used is, is um, screw bosses, and these create the ability to, say, put a plate on the end of this part and put a self-tapping screw in. Screw bosses can be extruded as uh, complete rounds, like in the lower right, but there's often no reason to do that. If you needed to make a shape in the lower right because you were going to run fluids through it or you know, needed to be pressurized or something like that, it's certainly possible. But if you're only going to put screw bosses, or if you're only going to put screws into it, you're really better off making a screw boss type shape as are shown in the other graphics on the slide. Again, work with your extruders. They can help you to solve your problems and save some money. This is a, an interesting series of graphics. The two on the left um, show an, a shape that's a three void hollow above the red one that says not this, um, which is extrudable. People could make this. But if you don't need those two bottom hollows to actually be separate pieces, you can much more easily, less expensively, extrude faster, reduce cost by having these nice round corners as well. The shape on the left will just extrude much better. And if this will meet your needs, it will actually save you some money. Similarly, on the right, um, these look very similar, but you can tell that the one on the far right is a two-void hollow. And the one on the left is a single void hollow. So again, it'll extrude a little bit faster. And if uh, just moving that screw boss to a different leg on the part, if that's acceptable, it probably has not changed the functionality at all. And if that's an acceptable solution, that'll save you some money. If you need to have the two void hollow for some other reason, structural or other usage reasons, great. It can be extruded. Um, sometimes, actually, people will make two different extrusions that meet together. So this is an example of a, a red extrusion on the outside and then the blue graphic on the inside sliding together to perform to uh, create a part. You know, sometimes you go the other way, though. There will be a part shown on the left, which uh, is, is, uh, has a lot of heat sink capabilities been in, built into it and a lot of uh, solid mass in the middle. In this case, uh, the extruder worked very closely with uh, the customer for exactly what they needed and what their goals were. And some of their goals were to put end plates on it, so they built into uh, some of these fins, the little screw bosses that you can see, the little C-shaped things pointing left or right. And they also created the shape with some internal hollow voids that uh, increased the functionality of the shape, uh, made it extrude better. And, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, certainly it's a, it's a very, very interesting extrusion, but it better met the needs of the customer. So... My advice to everyone is work with your extruders to get the most help that you possibly can. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn the show back over to Joe, who's going to talk about some other uh, features of extrusions and fabrication and some great uh, case studies. Sounds good. Thanks, Craig. So extrusions can be machined and formed and assembled with a wide variety of, of familiar technologies. Uh, there's some processes uh, particularly bending and welding that can benefit from prior experience in fabrication. So there's lots of uh, people out there who bend and weld lots of steel. Um, aluminum doesn't bend exactly the same way. However, with some modifications and some learning, you can, uh, you can do some really uh, neat things with extrusion. Using the proper alloy uh, will allow for excellent chip breaking when you're CNC machining it or cutting it or drilling it. Uh, with the appropriate uh, design and the right temper, uh, you can get some great uh, formability when stamping or hydroforming it, and the parts can be uh, easily notched and punched. The profile on the left here is a one-piece extrusion. So this is extruded as a, as a T-shape, and then it was CNC machined. So the slot along the bottom was CNC machined in, and the, and the, the two hollows on either side, uh, that was all machined in. Um, so this is a one piece, no welding, anything like that. This is all done in, in an extrusion uh, 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 die and then CNC machined afterwards. The profile on the right is a double hollow uh, enclosure extrusion. 
So it's been machined, uh, quite a bit of machine, machining done to it, uh, which will reduce the weight, and it's got all kinds of details incorporated into it that will allow for assembling, uh, installation of the electronic components, and then assembling the end caps uh, uh, on the end of it. This is uh, also a really interesting one, very uh, complicated extrusion. You see on the right-hand side the cross-section of, of that extrusion. Um, again, if you spec out the proper alloy, uh, working with your extruder and, and the right temper, you can cre create some, uh, some really interesting shapes. So this one is stretch bent. Um, it could also be CNC bent or chain bent. Um, it's extruded in a T4 temper and then the bend is act, the stretch bend is done to it and then it's heat treated after the fact. Uh, a T4 is as extruded and it allows you to do some, some other uh, additional bends that you may not be able to get in a T5 or a T6 temper. Uh, this part is, uh, is then powder coated and then the screw ports on, on the end are tapped so that the, the end caps can be, uh, can be installed. So this, this profile, those fins that you see are all actually uh, what I call bent the wrong way. So this profile, uh, the legs are, are facing out which allows the LEDs to be mounted uh, in between those two legs, and then the fins act, act as a heat sink to pull the heat off, of, uh, off the LEDs, which will uh, help to increase the life of the, of the product. And this is for, uh, obviously for an off-road vehicle. Uh, it mounts to the top of the vehicle, and because it's bent, it allows uh, the, the user to have a, wi a wider field of view, and the, the light lights up um, more, uh, more area. Right. Okay, so this one, uh, some of the fabrication <coughs> that you can do with extrusion, you can cut, punch, pierce, drill, machine, bend. Um, and this example on the bottom is a, an extrusion uh, to hollow uh, with some legs around it. It's been cut and tumble deburred. Uh, the second pi picture over has a bracket welded to it. And then the third picture, it's coated and it has a rivet nut installed on it. And then the finished part is, uh, is assembled. Um, back to Craig's point earlier, with a proper design and the proper alloy selection and um, a couple thousand dollars in, ex in extrusion tooling, you can have a new part up and running uh, very cost effectively and within a few weeks. Often we end up breaking or at least bending the rules to meet a particular product challenges. Uh, to meet multiple objectives. So aluminum is often costlier than other materials on a pound-for-pound -pound basis. For example, global steel, carbon steel price is around $714 a metric ton, whereas aluminum is $1,838 a metric ton. But what you have to do is make a realistic comparison and take into consideration the total cost of, of the product. So aluminum has a lower density. It's about a third of the weight of steel. So there's often many benefits in part weight reduction and reduced processing and assembly cost because the functionality can be designed into the part. As Craig mentioned earlier, uh, aluminum also has excellent corrosion resistance, which leads to reduced maintenance and overall end of life costs. And of course, it's 100% recyclable. So I'll go into a couple other scenarios here. So this one, the, the top part of this diagram is a, it's a solar PV project and they had a certain wind load requirement that had to be taken into consideration at the design stage. The channel is roughly 13 feet long and it needed to have two brackets uh, mounted to it in two, diff uh, in two different areas and it had to withstand a wind load of about 128 pounds per foot. So there's four potential solutions shown there. Um, three of them are steel and then the, the fourth one on the right hand side is extrusion. The bottom left is a standard type I-beam extrusion made of hot rolled steel. It's about three inches high and it nets out at a, approximately 39 pounds a piece. So around a, a hot rolled steel is about a, a buck a pound. So the price for a part that's uh, 13 feet long would be about $39. The second one from the left is a single channel, um, similar to hot rolled, and it nets out to around 47 pounds. So again, around $47 a stick. The third one over is a cold rolled form steel channel. So it's a, it's a much, thinner, um, much thinner profile than the hot rolled, but the profile had to be designed much bigger. So it's, it's about five and a half inches wide. Um, it, it's roll formed, which, uh, which can get expensive for uh, tooling, and it nets out around $30, or 30 pounds a piece, 
um, and, and roll formed is around, uh, the price would be around $33. So then the right hand side is aluminum extrusion options. Uh, we created a hollow rectangle with a flange on it and utilized 6005A alloy, which will help give us some strength over the 6063 alloys. This profile meets all the parameters for load testing and it comes in with the smallest overall size and weighs only 13 pounds a piece. So it's considerably less than the steel options. And it comes in with the lowest price for extrusion. This one would come in around $31. Of course, it also looks good and it has high corrosion resistance and it's 100% recyclable. On the building and construction side, here's an example of a 520,000 square foot federal building in Portland, Oregon. It's an old 35 year old building that uh, needed to uh, achieve some dramatic reductions in energy use and, and water consumption. So the solution for this one was found by installing some extrusions on the side of the building that, that received the most sun. So these, ex these extrusions um, were installed in a reed like manner and they cast a considerable amount of shade on that side of the building. They also mounted some extruded PV components on the roof um, some new extruded uh, double, double glazed windows and some smart lighting inside which included uh, LEDs with aluminum extruded housing and heat sinks on them. Overall, they achieved a reduction in energy use of about 55 to 60 percent um, versus the pre-retrofit. So they reduce costs, they have a quality product with easy serviceability and they have high corrosion resistance. It's a, it totally changed the look of the building. Uh, they have vines now growing up the sides of those reeds, so that's also causing, uh, so helping with the, with the shade and, and makes the, uh, the building uh, a little more appealing. This is the Accuray uh, example. It's a radiation system. Uh, the issue here was there were 64 mechanical leaves that opened and closed uh, during the radiation cycle to prescribe it the exact dosage of radiation. Periodically, these machine couplings would break and they would cause the extremely expensive machine to be shut down. So the solution here was the couplings, um, the couplings were, they were machined using EDM and they, and they had all kinds of uh, manufacturing steps to, to create these. Um, the customer worked with their extruder and they were able to redesign the part using 6063 alloy and they machined it and hard code anodized it. They now have a much stronger and durable part and it can be easily changed out. So the part weight was reduced, the manufacturing cost was reduced by almost 90% and the production time was reduced by 75% because you can extrude and fabricate these parts fairly quickly. And they now have a quality product that has significantly increased their uptime. The Lincoln MKZ, this is the 2013, uh, this was rolled out. Uh, it, it evolved from a roof module that Ford had designed for their, their edge vehicles. The existing design consisted of 28 different parts, which included a lot of stamp parts that require a high amount of uh, high investment dollars to create those stampings. The objectives were to come up with a solution that would reduce the weight by 25%. Uh, to help meet the CAFE standards to reduce uh, automotive weight and as well as significantly reduce the number of parts and consequently the labor cost to produce and assemble the system. So in the redesign, the, the, um, sorry. Yeah, in, in the redesign they came up with a new extruded, extruded side rail. So you see that profile on the bottom? You have some multiple hollows in there, some screw ports. Uh, there's some channels incorporated into it. They were able to reduce the number of parts from 28 down to six. Two of them, two of them are extrusions and then there's four small aluminum stampings. So this resulted in a 20% reduction in weight, a reduced labor cost, and assembly and installation was much quicker. Those cars are in production now, they're quite, uh, quite interesting. Okay, here's a uh, center mounted LED fixture. So the profile you see here in the middle, it says it's the original heat sink. So this was an offshore profile. 
with a very solid core. This, this goes against some of the stuff uh, Craig was showing earlier. You have a major mass in the middle with all these high tongue ratio fins sticking out. Um, the customer was bringing it in from overseas and they uh, were not getting stable deliveries and quality and they were trying to come up with a competitive price part here in North America. Um, so what the solution to this one, it got redesigned to that profile on the bottom. So after discussions with the extruder, it became evident the heat sink didn't need to have all that mass as much as it needed to have greater area for heat dissipation. So for this application with the LEDs and cooling the LEDs, they had to have area that pulled the heat away as opposed to a big solid blob of, of aluminum in there. So the existing heavy profile was redesigned. It incorporated four hollow profiles there. And then uh, you see towards the end of the profile, we have these little screw ports that were incorporated. The one above, the original one, was solid. The part would get cut and then anodized, and they would drill and tap so that they could mount the LED modules on here. But with the redesign, it was redesigned to incorporate screw ports, so there was no drilling and no tapping that had to happen. They just had to switch to a self-tapping screw and then drive it in. So the result here was a 47% uh, weight reduction and the elimination of secondary drilling operations which reduced the total cost and gave the customer a good local source to speed up manufacturing. Sorry, it seems to be stuck there. Oh, there we go. So here's another uh, example of a, an SUV. So their customer had uh, pillar covers and window guides that were made out of steel, and they wanted to uh, redo them, uh, again, trying to reduce the weight for um, CAFE standards. So the solution here was an extruded window guide and, and an extruded uh, pillar cover. The, it was a high visual requirement. The steel, the roll form steel parts that were that were there before were needed to be buffed before painting, and they were too heavy. So the result is a 35% reduction in the window guide and 40% reduction in the pillar cover, and you have a much better looking lightweight part. These parts also have a nice bend to them, as well as if you look in the circle on the left-hand side, there's a, it's rolled over to help uh, the contour when it's assembled onto the car. And here's the Mercedes uh, SL. Again, their major objective was looking for a significant reduction in weight. They were looking for an overall 300-pound reduction in their body shell. And the overall width of the floor assembly uh, is, is around 26 inches. So this is a, a very interesting product. That profiles, uh, there's three different extrusions that make that up uh, with varying wall thicknesses. The three pieces are joined together by friction stir welding. So overall, the assembly is 26, uh, 26 inches. You know, the, a 26 inch uh, extrusion uh, die would be very expensive and difficult to run. You wouldn't be able to run it with these thin, thin walls in here. So it got redesigned into three different extrusions, welded together, and they have a much, uh, much lighter floorboard. And it's actually, um, it's, the height of it is lower too than what, what, the, uh, what the steel was before, so which increases the inside, uh, inside room. So again, weight reduction, uh, easy to assemble. So in conclusion, aluminum extrusions provide a great resource for your next product uh, design or your redesign. They're lightweight, strong, corrosion resistant, and they're recyclable, sustainable material. They utilize many different alloys and can incorporate many design details and are easy to fabricate and give you a solution quickly and cost effectively. There's quite a few resources out there to help you push the envelope and create some superior products. We recommend you take advantage of them, and most importantly, bring in an extrusion expert as soon as, as early as possible in your design process, as they will definitely be able to help you design and launch much more quickly. 
So some resources we have, uh, there's an aluminum design manual that can be uh, ordered from aluminum.org. You can go to that site, there's all kinds of resources available regarding alloy, mechanical properties, and tolerances. Also, the American Society of Civil Engineers site at asce.org. You can get some design manual training there. And we strongly recommend you, you visit the AEC website. So that's the Aluminum Extruders Council website. On that, you can search for aluminum extruders. You can search various extrusion applications. Uh, and there's additional design resources there. And lots of information on sustainability, et cetera. So we'd like to thank our presenting sponsors, Alexandria Industries and SAPA North America, as well as all the member companies of the Aluminum Extruders Council. And with that, I will push it back to you and for the Q&A session. Thank you, Joe. Joining us for questions will be John Trenny, Inside Sales Associate for Alexandria Industries, and Jason Weber, who's Director of Business Development for SAPA Group. If you have a question, please submit it now asking the, using the Ask a Question box in the lower right corner of your screen. If we're not able to answer all the questions during the webcast, we will share the remaining questions with our speakers, and they will respond to you directly. Our first question is for Jason. This is, what are typical and best case tolerances that can be held? Jason? Yeah, sorry, I had you on mute. Thanks, Ann. Um, the, the typical extrusion tolerances that are going to be held are going to be directly related to the overall size of the profile. Typically, what you would see is that the smaller a profile would be, the more um, exact the tolerances can be. Um, that's typically because of the extrusion die and the, the secondary processing um, operations that are done to the profile. Um, as Joe uh, referenced before, there's the aluminum design manual, which will provide you with the guide as far as the typical tolerances that an extruder would be able to hold. But again, as was said many times during the, uh, the presentation, that, uh, you can always work with your aluminum extrusion partner, and they will typically be able to come up with you know, a, a, you know, a compromise in working together and finding out what exact tolerances that are required uh, for the specific application. Thank you. The next question will be for Joe. Should the aluminum alloy reference, oh, on slide 49 be 6063? <clears throat> Excuse me, 6063. Joe? Oh, okay, no problem. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah, the reference on that slide was said 6360. That was not a typo. Um, so, yeah, 6360 alloy is, is a little bit different than 6063. It's, it's got an easier breakthrough pressure, and it's, it's got about 4% higher uh, conductivity to it, so it's, a, it's just a slight change from a 6063, but with 6360, 60, 60, uh, it allows you, because it's got a better breakthrough pressure, you're not, um, it's not going to be as hard on the die. You can hold some more complicated shapes than you would be able to hold in 6063. And in the situation of an LED, when you're looking for a heat sink, um, the 4% the extra certainly doesn't hurt uh, for the, the conductivity. Thanks, Joe. The next question is for John. Can extrusion materials be welded if modifications are required, and what type of welding electrodes can be used? Uh, yes, aluminum extrusions are very weldable, and uh, you can use either MIG or TIG welding methods. Uh, the only concern would be a similar alloys to be used. Okay, thank you, John. The next question will be for Jason. And this is kind of a, lo a longish one. How large of a radius can an extruded part typically be bent at before the cross-section profile is deformed too much? And then the second part is, this would obviously be, be dependent on the shape and size of the profile, but is there a general rule of thumb for maximum bend radius? 
Um, well, that's a very detailed question. Um, I guess in you know, for the most part, one thing to remember is obviously we have to know what the what the method of bending that uh, would be used. If it's going to be roll bent or if there'll be some internal mandrel and what the overall size of the, the or the shape of the profile is, because obviously in bending you're going to have both um, uh, compression as well as stretching that goes on to the profile itself. So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. I guess I can't really say that there's a, um, you know, a, a, you know, a typical rule of thumb. Uh, one thing to remember is that um, aluminum has three times the spring back of steel, so you're going to have to bend that part typically three times as much to get it to stay in the final temper. So that's also uh, one of the uh, issues to consider when looking at a bent part. Um, again, very specialized when we start talking about bending of materials, and we need to work through, uh, you know, the specific requirements for that one. Great. Thank you, Jason. Looks like our next one will be for John. In reference to welding, does the welding reduce the extrusion properties or strength? And if so, can the part be somehow returned to original properties? Um, yes, the welding, due to the heat generated, and will typically uh, take the temper out of a very small area uh, surrounding the weld. Uh, it's possible to restore that, although it would probably be very, very expensive. Uh, you would have to go through a solutionizing process and then quenching and re-aging the product. Uh, typically, it's not necessary because it's such a small area where the wall takes the temper out. Okay, thank you, John. The next one is for Jason. Is there an online reference document that can provide dimensional, dimensioned sample rolling and snap-in profiles? Um, many many of the documents on there, as far as being online, I don't know. Obviously, the the aluminum design manual provides examples of you know the different the different screw bosses um, and different profile features like that that are typically used um, in the process. Um, for um, for other ideas, uh, SAPA does offer an an online um, app through the uh, Apple Store, um, so you can go in and search the SAPA design. Um, manual, and you'll actually be able to install an app on your Apple device. Um, and there are there is again some additional information in there. Probably not as much um, that is going to be able to um, you know provide an exact uh, reference to what you're looking for. Thank you. The next question is for John. Is forming or bending normally an in-house process or an outside process? Uh, for Alexandria Industries, it's an in-house process, uh, but that's going to vary from extruder to extruder. Some have forming processes and some do not. Um, the advantage, of course, is when it's in-house, then we can do the forming and the artificial aging afterwards to attain greater uh, or higher temper properties in the final product. Thank you. The next question is for Jason. If I ultimately want an extruded 6061 T6 part post-machining, should heat treat be done after the machining is finished, or can it be extruded T6? If the, if the part is just going to be uh, um, basically machined, um, you're actually going to want to extrude that, um, or excuse me, process that part. Uh, in the T6 condition. Um, the T6 condition, and then also there are other tempers out there that are specifically made for machining parts, which give you, um, you know, different grain structures and different um, uh, chip breakage um, within your process, which would actually help uh, the throughput of the process. So yes, that, that would, you would want to order that profile in the 6061 T6 uh, condition and then um, machine it after. Okay, thanks. 
We've got time for a couple more questions. The first of those will be for John. In an early slide showing two screw boss designs, one appeared to have three small ribs in the screw boss. Um, it looks like it says, is that something for self-taping screws? Uh, typically, we do not add any ribs when the use of self-tapping screws because you want to maximize the amount of material that the screws would uh, be biting into. Um, on that particular design, I'm not exactly sure why the ribs were there, but I would not think it was for self-tapping screws. Okay, thank you. And our last question is for Joe. In your design hints, you say to minimize deep, narrow tongues, yet the LED heat sink would appear to have them. What is the secret to executing such shapes? As it appears, they can't be very useful. Yeah, they can be, yeah, they can be quite useful. I think, as, as Craig was saying earlier uh, on the design section, you know, there's different ways of, of, of designing channels. You can have wall thicknesses that vary. Um, and although it can be extrudable, it's easier, or, or you can extrude faster if you have uni uniformity there. So it depends what the part is that you're looking for. What, when you get a high tongue ratio profiles like some of the ones that were in the presentation, you know you can't you can't put that to press and pound it through. Ultimately, extruders have presses and they they try to make their money by getting as many good pounds out per hour. So um, you can do more complicated shapes. You just can't run them as fast. So you have to you have to slow down your presses and your your pounds that come out per hour are obviously much lower than if it was a uniform channel. Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you to both Craig and Joe. Design News appreciates your time and effort to help make this webinar a success. Lastly, thanks to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. We hope what you heard and saw today was interesting and helpful. The presentation will be available shortly in an on-demand format. As a registered user, you will receive an email with detailed information on how you can access the on-demand replay of this webinar. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been able to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2014 by Design News. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by AEC. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.